Well, good morning. good morning. Oh, yeah. It is good to be here this morning. My name is Eric. I'm the associate pastor here at 704 Church. The opportunity to help lead this church, this wonderful body of believers. Um, it has been a minute since I've been able to stand here at the pulpit and preach and have this opportunity. I'm just excited to be here. Um, this morning, we are uh, continuing in our mini-series throughout the month of July called Favorites. And uh, if you've been here, if you were here last week, Pastor Thad kicked us off uh, with his message last week. And we're going to, after this week, we're going to have two more, two more weeks in this series. And I would encourage you, if you are in the area and uh, have nothing to do on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, come continue to join us. Um, and I just see, continue to see God's uh, word being shared in such amazing ways from different people. And I love the, the one of many things of this church and this leadership that allows other people to speak into this community. Hey, I just got to give a quick shout out. I uh, pleasantly surprised my neighbors are in the building this morning. Um, they, uh, they surprised me. Uh, Sharon, um, where are they at? There they are. Sharon and Will Robinson, they are, they are close friends of ours. They moved in a little bit after us, and man, we just connected. They're like, they're family to us. Our kids, every morning when Miss Sharon is leaving and they're not in school, they run out and they just give her a big hug. They're just an awesome group of people. They actually attend um, New Beginnings Church up in Matthew, so they're here just supporting me. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, this morning, as I said, I'm continuing in the mini-series. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, I wouldn't say this is my favorite, but it's one of my favorite uh, portions of Scripture, one of my favorite stories. It's a very familiar uh, Scripture uh, that I'm sure if you grew up in the church or if you're kind of new to the church, that you, I'm sure you have heard about the battle of David and Goliath. Who here has never? I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm just kidding. But it's a very familiar portion of Scripture. It's where David is battling Goliath. And I don't know how to take my lock screen off. I'm just going to have to wing it. No, I might need you. You're better than me at this stuff. You're still like this. I'll be in real trouble. <laughs> All right, I'll just, like yeah, 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 okay. I wanted to be fancy like you. All right. Can I stay up here? Do I need to know your password? Okay. All right. Thanks for the help. All right, so where were we? All right, so David and Goliath. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you have your Bible, open it up, turn it on, whatever you got to do, stay involved, stay awake. Hopefully I'm not too boring for you this morning. But we're going to be uh, kind of bouncing around in chapter 17. I'm not going to read the whole book. We're going to start from verse 4, uh, go to verse 11, and then jump to 32, verse 40, and then 45 through 49. But before we get into God's word, would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this, um, this morning. God, I thank you for worship. I thank you for prayer. I thank you for even before that we entered into this building, God, that your presence is here. Father, it moves, God. Scripture tells us that it's, your presence is always at work. You're always moving, Father. And so, Father, I just pray right now. I pray for every heart, every soul, every mind in this room that you would open up our ears, open up our eyes to see and hear of God, your goodness in your word in this place, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Here we go. All right, so verse 4, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Follow along with me. It says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor, a bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Jump with me to verse 32. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. 
Saul replied, you are not able to go out and against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he had been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took, off, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Jump with me to verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, when you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give you the carcasses of the Philistines' army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into your hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking care of a, taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Very familiar portion of Scripture, right? We've heard it so many times in Sunday school. Maybe on an on a, on a, on a old movie, you've seen the story of David and Goliath, that David overcomes Goliath. Little David defeats big Goliath. I was a senior in high school um, when the World Trade Tower were hit by the two planes, I grew up in uh, North Jersey, so we were really close to downtown Manhattan. My father worked in lower Manhattan, and so he worked actually in a building right next to the Twin Towers, and so I actually had an opportunity to go to the, the top of one of the towers when we were young. But I remember that day, we were in second period, and we got word, and so uh, our school sat on a hill that overlooked the skyline of New York City, and on a clear day, you can see every building. It was beautiful. And that day we ran up there and we saw what was going on and we were just in complete shock. And I think for, for the most part, living there all my life for 35 years or so, uh, just living so close, being in New York City often, uh, it, it impacted me and, and those that lived there, maybe a little more than some of you that maybe live down here or living elsewhere and, and watching on TV, not taking away from the fact that how it impacted our country as a nation. But I remember then, and I think about these big events in these lives, it's one of those events that you'll just never erase from your memory, you know? But I remember starting after the towers were attacked and, and weeks went by and, and people started talking or continued talking about it and the smoke was continuing to build for months. I remember hearing people started to conspire and started coming up with these conspiracy theories of there's no way that the jet fuel from these planes could burn through the steel beams of these huge buildings and cause it to collapse. It had to be some sort of other way. It had to be a, a controlled explosion. You know, you, you ever hear or you ever know anybody that loves conspiracy theories, that gets involved and they just get really into it? It's like their minds are just different you know, and they come up with these different ways of how it, they think it really happened and how some of these different agencies or a different, different group of people actually planned something. I mean, I, I Google just for the sake of it, I Google conspiracy theories and the, the Twin Towers was one of them. But there's a whole list of theories that people have come up with that, you know, the JFK assassination or uh, that we really didn't land on the moon. It's just a big hoax or the, the kind of the latest one is covid you know, 
but they come up with these conspiracy theories and these different ways of how things actually happened. Now, I'm not personally that person to get involved. You know, if I hear someone come up with a conspiracy theory, I'm just like, no, you're, you're, you're whack. You know? I'm just like, no, it's what was told to me on TV, and you have to believe it. Right? <laughs> but this morning, I kind of want to... I want to set my own conspiracy theory to this story. I want to raise a question that would make us and hopefully help us to think, you know, because a lot of our lives we've heard that David killed Goliath. Well, this morning, I'm going to set my own conspiracy theory. I'm going to raise a question. Who really killed Goliath? And I think as we go through the scripture, we're going to find out that the answer might not be what we have been told for so many years. We're going to start, uh, kind of go back to um, the beginning of this story and just set up the, set up the, uh, the scene for you. We have the uh, Israeli army uh, fighting the Philistines. And there's a valley in between. Uh, that one camp is on one side of the hill and the other camp is on the other side of the hill in verses 1 through 3. And in verse 8, we see that Goliath steps out. All right, and he's cursing the people of Israel, and he's cursing their God, and he's defying the name of the Lord God Almighty, and nothing is happening. And for 40 days or for 40 nights, this giant comes out and is just cursing the name of the Lord God, and he's cursing the armies, and he's challenging them. And every time that he would come out, he would step forth from the battle line and boastfully just shout at them, the people of Israel, the, the warriors, God's army would run in fear. The Bible says even Saul was apprehensive, that he was fearful. Let's take a look at Goliath. I got a, a picture that I think is an actual picture of Goliath uh, on there. I found out how to dig a lot. You got that picture, Jack? Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. There you go. That's an actual picture of Goliath, they said. <laughs> But no, Goliath was this big guy. Scripture says that he, um, he was not, uh, six cubits and a span, about nine feet, six inches. Just some details of Goliath. Okay, nine feet, six inches. That's, that's big. That's a big boy, right? An average male is about, uh, in the U.S., is five feet, nine inches. Average male, okay? I'm six foot four, so I'm, a, I'm above average. Um, but nine feet, six inches, okay? I coach basketball for... 10 years in the varsity level. I've been around the game. I've done clinics, camps. Uh, I've coached some really tall guys. Uh, I think 6'9", if you're 6'9", you're just, you're a giant in my book. I'm 6'4", so 6'9", that's tall. All right, so Goliath is 9 feet 6 inches. When I was preparing for this message, I actually went into um, my very small tool chest and, uh, and got my uh, one and only tape measure, and I, and I actually went up as far as 9 feet 6 inches. And, I mean, it was huge. It was tall, okay? Um, Guinness Book of World Record has the tallest man, Robert Wadlow. I got a picture of him, all right, that Jack just already put up, okay? Keep that picture there. Robert Wadlow is eight feet six inches, okay? He's standing next to his father, Harold, all right? Robert was um, uh, born in Illinois. He didn't really live a long life because of complications because of his height, but Robert was eight feet six inches, so a foot shorter than Goliath from this picture, and you can see he's just a monster. All right. Actually, for just to continue with Robert, we uh, have a picture of his shoe. You want to put on that picture? All right. So his shoe's on the right. The shoe next to him is a size 12. I'm a size 12. That's an average shoe, uh, shoe size. All right. But you can just see, again, just how big this guy is. And yet Goliath is a foot taller than him. Okay. But not just tall, we know that Goliath had to be strong. He had to be big because of the weight that he carried as a warrior. Okay, scripture says that he carried a bronze helmet. He wore a coat of scale. He had a javelin on his back. Scripture doesn't directly point out that he had a sword, but if you read further on in the chapter, we know that after David killed Goliath, he took Goliath's sword and cut off his head. So we know that he had a sword to add to the weight. He also wore uh, bronze greaves on his shins. So easily, the weight that Goliath was carrying was easily over 125 pounds. Okay, this is what he's carrying. And he's carrying this day after day. 
because he's a warrior. Scripture says he's a champion. He knew how to battle, and he had to do it with all of this armor, all this weight on him. The average U.S. soldier carries about 27 pounds, okay? So again, just a comparison of what this guy, how big he is and how strong he is. And he also had extensive experience in single combat. So this guy was no joke, okay? It's pretty obvious of why the Israelites feared because they saw this guy for 40 days just coming out and raging and wanting to fight them. And there's no way that any one of them was going to step up to this challenge. But now let's, let's change the page to David. Okay, so David uh, is um, he's the youngest son of Jesse. He has eight brothers, or he's the youngest of eight. And uh, his father tells him, hey, listen, I need you to go to the battlefield. I need you to check on your brothers, check out what's going on. I need you to bring them something to eat, something to drink. So David goes, and on his arrival to the battlefield, he sees what's going on. He sees this giant of a, of a, of a man cursing the name of the Lord God, the God of the Israel army. And he's like, no one's doing anything about this. What are we doing? This dude's dishonoring God's name and no one's stepping up to the challenge. David, uh, scripture says that he was a shepherd boy, okay? He was about 16 through 19 years of age. He was about a teenager, okay? Uh, He wore no armor. All right, so just a little comparison between uh, David and Goliath. He wore no armor. Um, He wasn't even comfortable wearing King Saul's armor. He wanted the things that was comfortable to him, his sling and his staff. The only fighting experience that, uh, that David had was fighting a lion and a bear. And we'll get to that in a second. But clearly, my point in this to, com- to compare is clearly you can see that Goliath had the upper hand. He had the advantage in this battle. David had no business going up against this giant. He was outmatched. Goliath was bigger, stronger, and more experienced. So you're telling me that David killed Goliath? I want to rewind, rewind the videotape and show the instant replay uh, of how this plays out. Look at verse 48 to 49. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So there we have it. There we have it. David kills Goliath. David overcame Goliath, right? But there's one portion of scripture in this chapter that we're missing. Let's go back to it. Okay. Uh, Verse 26. He has a conversation with Saul when he comes to Saul. Verse 26. David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David is in the battlefield. He asks the guys, uh, his brothers and the people around him, what's going on? Why why isn't anybody taking care of this? You know, and there's Saul's officials around him, and he, he overhears David talking. And so he brings David to Saul. And this is where David and Saul interact with one another. And as David comes to Saul and says, I want to fight him. I want to stand up against this giant who's defying my God's name because no one else is doing it. No one else in your army is doing it. And so Saul says, you're just a boy. There's no way. I'm not sending you out there. And this, men and women, this, friends, this is where we need to understand who God is. Okay, so David talks to um, Saul in verse 34 through 36. David recounts the time that he fought the bear and the lion. Look at me. Look with me in verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Just like David had no business 
fighting Goliath. He had no business fighting a lion or a bear. You've seen pictures of lions. You've seen, you, you know where I'm getting at. Okay, the, the king of the jungle, a bear. I mean, just a monster. I mean, ferocious beasts. And here we have a story. I mean, look at this thing. There's no way I'm wrestling a lion. There's no way none of you guys are wrestling. I'm sorry. I don't care how macho you are. I mean, take a look. No way. But here, David goes back and recounts and remembers. As much as I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting here preparing this and reading, I'm like, there's, there's no way that I'm fighting a lion or a bear. I mean, those people in the circus that get into cages with these animals. You ever seen when animals, like, go wild or something? And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's crazy. But this boy, a 16 to 19-year-old, fights lions and bears. And he does it with the help of the Lord. So... My question that we continue to ask is, who rescued David from the lion and the bear? Who delivered him that day when he was fighting the ferocious beast? The Lord God did. Amen. And this is where we begin to understand the point of this story. David remembered who rescued him right before he fought Goliath. David remembered God's faithfulness. He trusted God during the moments with the fiercest animals. He knew God would do the same as he's about to approach Goliath. God was preparing David, and he was preparing him for the prize fight of his life. And it was about to be in a matter of moments. So David goes up against Goliath. He grabs the items that he needs. He grabs his sling. He grabs the five stones. And he approaches Goliath. And again, just put yourself in this situation now. Okay, you're Goliath. You've been, you've been ranting and raving, cursing, defying God's name, calling out this. Just give me one person from your army, right? Just send me one person for 40 days. And nothing happens until from out of the battle line of the, the Israeli army, a boy steps out. What do you think Goliath is, go what do you think he's thinking? You're sending me a boy? Out of all of you guys, you're sending me a little boy. Goliath starts cursing at David. Look what, look what Goliath says. He goes, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistines curse David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you the flesh of the birds and the wild animals. I can't imagine that David steps out fearless. You have to think that David is trembling a little bit inside. But I love the approach that David did, does. And it, it's a reminder for us that when fear or anything in your life comes and it tries to attack you because it, it, it will and it does, is that we have to move forward in our walk with Jesus Christ, understanding that, that he is faithful. I love how David goes back and remembers what God had already done in his life that prepared him for what is now to come. And men and women, this is what we have to do in our lives. We have to remember God's goodness. We have to remember God's faithfulness because we all battle something. The one thing I love about this church is that I know most of you guys. And so I know some of you guys are battling some of you guys are battling big things. Some of you guys are battling little things. But God is faithful. God is always faithful. One of my favorite scripture in the Bible is even when we're not faithful, God is faithful. And it's just one of those things that we have to remind ourselves and remember every time that we face a battle in our lives. So my question is now, as David is approaching Goliath, and Goliath sees this boy come out and is probably upset because this is what I have to fight. This is going to be an easy one for me. Bring it on. Look at verse 45 through 47. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with the sword and the spear and the javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and I'll cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into your hands. So men and women this morning, who killed Goliath? The Lord, the Lord did. God did. The battle is the Lord's. David trusted God and knew God would deliver him. It was God who helped David. It was God who made David a skilled marksman with the sling. It was God who made David super accurate on the very first try. It was God who gave David the courage to stand up to the giant. And it is God who brought the victory, not just for David, but for the people of Israel that day. Yeah, amen. Amen. So here we are. That's a great story, right? But, but what, what do we do? How are you? How are you battling your giants in your life? How are you handling the difficult situations that come upon us? Because we know that this life is not just a cakewalk. There's battles. There's trials. There's tribulation in our lives. And we know that we're going to face them. It's just a matter of when. But I'm here this morning to hopefully encourage you is that you don't do it on your own. We're too weak. Uh, I have two kids, Brooke and Bryce. Uh, besides my wife, they are the love of my life. Um, Brooke is eight. Bryce is six. And I remember um, two weeks after Bryce was born, uh, my wife, Chels, had some complications and started um, getting really high fevers. And for a few days, she had fevers at, at 104, and that we knew something was wrong. And so for three attempts, she went to the emergency room. The first two attempts, they sent her back home. And it was until the third attempt when she went to the emergency room with these high fevers that she convinced them to admit her, and they finally did. And so she's in this hospital now, and she has these high fevers. And so they do some scans and some testing, and they, they, do a, they go and they do a procedure. They did that procedure on Friday night. The next day, her fevers are back up high again. And I talked to her about it, um, and, and she said that, that just being in a hospital, having this situation is scary enough. But it was in that moment after that first procedure that after they did it and it didn't work because the fevers came back, that she said, this is when her real battle began. And it was the battle of the unknown, of, of God, what's going on right now with my body? Besides the fact that she has a 20-month home, old at home and a two-week old at home. And she was battling. And I remember, I remember, I remember her in the moment. Man, my wife's so strong. Fellas, if you're not married, y'all need to find a strong woman. <laughs> But I remember watching her getting, getting poked and prodded with needles, and they're testing her, and they're, 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 they're trying to figure out what actually is happening, what's causing the fevers, especially after the first procedure. And they, they, they do some more scans and some more testing, and they, she goes in and has another surgery, and she has a hysterectomy, and, and that's when, the, that's when the, the fever started decreasing. But what's encouraging to me and is hopefully encouraging to you is in that moment when she just, it was, she was consumed with the fear and the anxiety is that she did not allow that to continue. Yeah. Is that she held on. Oh, man. Woo. She held on to the word of God. And she was reminded in Psalm 91. If you have your Bible, you got to turn with me to Psalm 91. This is what enabled her to know who was with her in those dark moments when she's by herself in the hospital. She would play Psalm 91. She would listen to it. This was her strength, the word of God. Let me be real frank with you. For those that are following Jesus, and we know 
is that if you're walking with Jesus, you cannot neglect the word of God. This has to be such a high priority in your life. Because in the moments of the battles that we all face, it's the word of God that we should run to. This is what she held on to. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foul snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, but ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you." You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Verse 9, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all, all your ways. Not just one way, not just the easy way, all your way. They will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy and show him my salvation. Amen and amen. Jesus is all we need. Amen. David knew that. David knew of God's faithfulness that prepared him for what he was about to do. I'm sure he had some fear because he was human just like you and me. But again, I think the point of that is that he did not allow that fear to stop him. It was God's faithfulness, and it was about a measure of faith that he stepped forward and continued. I want to give, if you're taking notes, I want to give three, I think, key spiritual principles that will help you to remember about this story. And the first one is we should be more concerned about God's honor than about ourselves. We should be more concerned about God's honor than about ourselves. David was very concerned about God's honor. When he approached that battlefield, he was was shocked that nothing was being done. He wasn't willing to allow Goliath to get away with taunting the armies of the Lord, cursing the name of God. What do we do in the situation where we hear people cursing God's name, dishonoring God's name? Are we honoring God's name so much that when we hear God's name being cursed that we do something about it? I'm not trying to bring guilt on your life. But as again, as, as believers in, in Jesus, we need to honor his name. We need to put that high in our lives that when his name is being dishonored, we don't put up with that. David did it. The second point, God's past faithfulness in our lives should encourage us to take more steps of faith. David had the courage to fight Goliath because the Lord had already enabled him with the killing and the fighting of the lion and the bear. God had been preparing David for the moment, and God does the same for us. Number three, when we face battles that look impossible, we need to remember that the battle is the Lord's. David fought Goliath, and he was merely God's instrument, a vessel being used by God. And that's who we are today. If you follow Jesus, we are his vessels. We are his instruments to be used by him. And when God calls us to do something that takes courage and boldness, we need to be obedient and trust him. Because knowing that the battle is the Lord's, it's not yours and it's not mine. So where do we go from here? What do we do about it? It's a great story. The battle is the Lord's. God killed Goliath that day. David was just God's instrument. He was obedient. Every day, every day we know we we face so much 
in this world, in this current state of this world that we live in, we face so much struggle, hardship, maybe a financial disaster, relationship problems, fear. I mean, I could go on and on and on with what we battle, right? Anxiety, temptation, addiction. Or the biggest one that we probably overlook a lot is that we are deserving of God's uh, wrath because of our sinful nature, our disobedience. And I think the conspiracy that the enemy wants us to believe as we're raging and battling these giants in our lives is that we have to do it by ourselves. Because we know that the enemy is what? A liar and a deceiver. And too many of us, too many of us believe that we have to do it by ourselves. Even believers in the, in the name of the Lord is that we have to fight these battles by ourselves. Or sometimes we just forget. I mean, we're human. We make mistakes. I get it. But the enemy wants us to believe that we have to do this by ourselves because eventually, ultimately, he wants to destroy us. He wants us dead. He wants the people of God dead. And we see it in this world that we're living, the persecution. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're fighting your own battle right now. And it doesn't matter how hard you try, if you're going to do this by yourself, you're not going to accomplish it. You're not going to have the victory when you're doing it by yourself. You're not going to win. And the enemy wants all of us in this room to believe that. What we have to understand is just like David, the battle is the Lord's. But we see in the, the gospel account of Luke chapter 4. And it's a, it's a story of when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan. He was tempted three times. But I love in the scripture of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, it says, We have a high priest who has been tempted in every way and never sinned. Jesus knows, my point is this, Jesus knows what you go through. Jesus knows the, the tempting that you face each and every day. He experienced it. But the only difference is that he never sinned. He never slipped. Just like Satan wants us to fail, he wanted Jesus to fail. But when we, look at that, when we look at Luke chapter 4, we see two things that Jesus did. Two things that Jesus relied on. Number one, the word of God. And number two, that he was standing firm in his commitment to worship God and God alone. And even after this encounter uh, that Satan has with Jesus, we know that the enemy is still out there. He's still on a rampage trying to destroy the people of God. He's trying to destroy all of us. But it wasn't until that day that Jesus had enough with this. And he took our pain. He took our suffering. And he nailed it to the cross. And that day, he won our forgiveness. He fulfilled the scripture once and for all. Jesus took it upon his life. Jesus won the victory that day when he nailed his life to the cross so that you and me have the victory today and forevermore. The battle is the Lord's. This is what I hope you will. If, if nothing else, the battle is the Lord's. Will you stand with him in faith this morning? Will you stand knowing that what Jesus did for your life, the one that overcame death, sin, and the grave, the one that overcame your sin, every single sin that you have committed, are committing, and will commit. It's forgiven. That day, the battle was won. Whew. The one who fights, the battle is fighting for you. 
Will you stand with me? I think we're drawn to a story like David and Goliath, not just because it's super familiar, but because it's a really cool underdog story. Everyone loves when the little guy comes out on top, right? When the 15 seed upsets the number two seed in the NCAA tournament. Love seeing that. You cheer for the underdog. If anybody makes a Duke comment right now, I'm about to lose it. But we love a story like that. And, and, and here we, we have been, we've been taught for so many years. I'm not saying that Sunday school teachers were wrong, that David killed Goliath. We know that's true. But so many times people paint the picture that David was the underdog. Makes sense, it, right? It looks right in Scripture. David wasn't the underdog. Goliath was the underdog. Why? Because who was Goliath fighting? Whew, stood no chance. Stood no chance that day, right? And this is the same for you and for me. You don't have to fight your battles. Yeah, you're a vessel. Yeah, you have to step out in faith. Yeah, you have to be obedient when God calls you and, and you're in a situation that is really, really tough. I know there's people in here that are struggling with a sickness. I know there's people in here that are struggling with relationships. I know there's people in here that, that struggle with addictions and temptations. We all are in, 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 in the same boat. But it's when we understand. See, the difference is when we understand who is fighting our battles. You don't have to worry. God has given us the victory. We have to walk in it, plain and simple. I believe this morning, uh, as we as we step into uh, response time, growing up I called it ministry time. Is that I believe that the Holy Spirit is ministering to us right now. The Holy Spirit is working in your lives. And there's two calls this morning that I, I want to give that kind of ties in with this story. And so if, if you're on the prayer team this morning, would you, would you just step out into this? We have this middle aisle right here. If you are an elder or a leader in, in the church, would you step out? There's two calls this morning uh, that I want to give. It's a, it's a call of surrender and a call of repentance. And if you're here this morning and you are a believer, you've been walking with Christ, you, you know this story, you know scripture, but you, we make mistakes and you have been battling something and you have just been battling it by yourself. My call to you this morning, my, my, my encouragement is to surrender the battle. Surrender the battle, lay it down. Whether it's a big thing or even a small thing, don't discount the small battles in our lives. So if you're here this morning and you're walking with Jesus, but you're battling by yourself, surrender that battle this morning. Come receive prayer. The other call this morning is a big one. It's a call to surrender your life. To lay down the life that you have been walking by yourself, not just the battles, but your life by yourself. And knowing that this man, Jesus, who walked 2,000 years ago, laid down his life for you and for me so that you can walk, the Bible says, as a new creation, that the old has gone, that new, that old you is in the past. And when you step into salvation is that there's a new creation and you walk in a newness of who Jesus is. And so if that's you this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, don't miss this moment. Don't walk out of here the same. Give your life over to Jesus. We have people that, that know what they're doing. They want to pray with you. 
We're not here to embarrass you because I know it's a big step of faith to step out and, and walk down there or, or up there. I get it. But we're not, we're not that type that we want to embarrass you. We, we want you to have a life-changing moment. So step out in faith this morning. The Holy Spirit has been stirring in you. Respond to the call to lay down and surrender your battle and lay down to surrender your life. We're going we're gonna to close out this morning with a little bit of worship. And men and women, if you're here and you know how good God is, will you worship as we leave this place? Raise your hands, open up your mouth, sing joyfully unto the Lord.